Welcome to the Motivational Midwife. I'm Lynn Jones and today we're going to look at cord prolapse. So cord prolapse. So as with always, we'll start with what is it? So this is when the umbilical cord has come through the cervix and it's either alongside, so it's next to the baby's head, or it's gone past the baby's head. But the key point is that it is in the presence of ruptured membrane. So the water's have already gone. If the water the membranes are still intact, then we're looking at cord presentation. And how are you going to recognise it? Well, you'll either see it because it'll be obvious. The mother will say that she can see something or feel something dangling. Um, you will hear it. So as the membranes rupture, often there is a fetal heart deceleration at that point or some sort of fetal heart rate irregularity. So even in a, a spontaneous labour, when membranes rupture, it's always a good idea to auscultate the fetal heart as soon as those membranes rupture. And if there is any... Um, concerns then undertake a vaginal examination to exclude cord prolapse um, or you might feel it on vaginal examination um, and certainly if it's sitting in the vagina then that's fairly easy but if it's an occult one so it's sitting at the side of the head that's not always as easy and certainly um, I was only qualified three months when I had my first cord prolapse and that's exactly where it was it was next to the baby's head and if I hadn't have been trying to define position I probably would have missed it um, so RCOG cite the incidences between 0.1 and 0.6% of all births are complicated by cord prolapse. And that obviously goes up to 1% in breach because breach, particularly where you have the baby's um, legs under the buttocks, so they're sitting little cross-legged like a little Buddha, um, they, there is more space there for that cord to be able to drop down. And the current embrace, the 2020 embrace um, figures, state that really 5.3% of all stillbirths were attributed to cord prolapse. Um, and this extended, of course, into the neonatal deaths and extended perinatal um, deaths, which were also as a result of cord prolapse. So those extended perinatal deaths, these babies will have been born alive. They will have had probably extensive resuscitation, but they have been left with um, morbidities. Um, that if eventually really they've not been able to survive from. So looking at some risk factors. So if we start with the, the risk factors associated really with the baby. So if there is any issues with the head, so things like anencephaly, hydrocephaly, those babies are very often much more likely to be in a breach presentation. And we've already said breach um, increases the risks of uh, core prolapse. Um, and likewise, your unstable or your abnormal lies, so your oblique lies, your transverse lies, uh, babies that seem to flip from one to the other. The more they do that, the more chance there is of the cord becoming um, positioned in front of the baby. And your preterm and your low birth weight babies. Preterm babies are very often in a breech position um, anyway, and the low birth weight babies, they've got more room. They can get themselves into all sorts of positions. And looking at some uterine factors, so if we've got um, polyhydramnia, so too much amniotic fluid or oligohydramnia is too little, then these can be issues for cord prolapse as well. The polyhydramnia, obviously, the um, fetus doesn't always engage very well, and, and that can be an issue for the cord getting in front of the baby. And oligohydramnia, particularly if that baby has already got itself into a breech presentation, then it's very difficult for it to move out of that presentation. If we've got things in the uterus that prevent the baby being able to engage well um, or be in a cephalic presentation, so things like a low-lying placenta, uterine fibroids, if there's any abnormalities with the pelvis, so think about people who may have had uh, road traffic accidents, horse riding accidents, anything where the pelvis may have been damaged. 
And then there's us. Obviously, we always cause problems, I'd feel. So artificial rupture of membranes. So before you do an ARM, think, do I really need to do this ARM? Um, is my presenting part well engaged um, before I undertake this ARM? Because if you have a what's called um, a blottable head, so one that, that easily comes back out of the pelvis, um, then I would be much more cautious about undertaking artificial rupture of membranes on those women because there is the, the chance that the cord could slip down. And indeed, this is an issue for polyhydramnius, um, and that's often done as a controlled ARM, usually as part of an induction process on these women. Um, and more often than not, it would be done by a registrar or a consultant for that very reason is that there is a risk of cord prolapse. And um, usually when they're undertaken, you have normally made sure that you have a theatre free just in case you have to go straight to theatre. External cavallic version. So this is where your registrar, your consultants usually have um, attempted to turn the baby um, from a breech presentation to a cephalic presentation. An internal pedalic version, this is relates to twin two. So when twin one's born, if twin two has got itself into an oblique or a transverse lie, the um, consultant or the registrar will usually put a hand in and try and grab a foot and move the baby around to a longitudinal lie, but in the process of doing that could also um, get a cord in front of the baby. So looking at our care, and we're going to take it mostly from a home perspective, because in a hospital, you can be fairly certain that when you ring your call bell, a lot of people are going to come um, and help you very quickly. And so you'll be able to manage the uh, emergency in a very, very timely manner. At a home situation, you haven't got the luxury of extra people there. Um, and you also haven't got the luxury of being able to deal with it in a very, very timely manner and get your lady to theatre in a very timely manner because she is at home. You have that delay of getting an ambulance to you and then getting in. So the first thing you need to do when you've diagnosed that you have got a cord prolapse is really get your lady to get into a knee chest position because this is going to help relieve the pressure um, off the cord and while she's doing that really you need to call for help you need that help to be on its way to you because there's limited things you're going to be able to do at a home um, emergency so you need to ask for a 999 blue light paramedic ambulance just phoning up and saying i'm needing an ambulance is not going to be appropriate because what you will probably get is a first responder so a guy on a bike which um although it'd be lovely to see them they're not going to be a real help to you. You need to make it very clear when you make that phone call that you need a blue light paramedic ambulance, that this is a time critical neonatal emergency and you need to transfer in ASAP. If your um, second midwife is not already at your home birth, then it may be worth getting her en route because she may arrive before the ambulance, which will give you a second pair of hands to actually manage this emergency. And you need to let Delivery Suite know what's going on so they can get your multidisciplinary team on standby because this lady, when she arrives at hospital, will be going straight to theatre. So undertake a vaginal examination, confirm dilatation and see if you've still got a pulsating cord or not. Um, auscultating your fetal heart rate is not a priority at this point because there's very little you're going to be able to do about it. Um, so you just need to be sure if you can feel the cord pulsating, you can count that and you'll have a vague idea of actually what your fetal heart is like. If she is a multip, if she's fully dilated, if the presenting part is low, get her to give one good push. And if the, there's really good descent, and by really good descent, I mean it's coming around that bend really quick, you know that it's going to deliver, then prepare for birth and resuscitation of the baby. If she's not fully dilated, if she's a primate, if the descent is poor, then we really need to think about preventing cord compression. So the first thing we would do is digital pressure. OK, so you're putting your fingers on the baby's head and you're trying to push the baby's head up to try and relieve the pressure on the cord. Whilst doing that, you'll probably find that the cord slips into the palm of your hand. And so what will happen is as your fingers are in, it gently will um go back into the vagina. Don't handle the cord any more than you need to because you will cause vasospasm and we that will further reduce the um, blood supply to the baby. So if, if it slips back into the vagina, that's great. It will keep it warm, but don't actively try and be pushing it all back in there. 
The second thing we can do, and there's very good evidence around this improving outcomes for um, babies of called prolapse. Some, some of the evidence even cites that there has been as much as a 30 delay, a 30 minute delay between um, diagnosis and delivering the baby and the baby has been born in good condition. So this, this can quite literally be a lifesaver for this baby is to fill the bladder. Now, if you think about normal labour care, we're often encouraging women to empty their bladder every two to four hours because we say to them, well, if you've got a full bladder, it's going to keep the baby's head up. Well, in this instance, that's exactly what we want it to do, because if we can raise that baby's head up or the presenting part up, then we're going to be able to keep the pressure off the cord for a little bit better. Now, when this first came into being, nobody actually showed us or me, certainly, how that was actually possible to fill the bladder. So it's also well and good saying, oh, we fill the bladder, but you really need to know how you can do that. So what you need is a Foley's catheter. Um, so that's an indwelling catheter, a giving set and your bag of 500 mils of saline. And you put your the end of your giving set that you would normally connect to the cannula into the end of the catheter that you would normally connect the urine bag to and push it in as far as it will go. Then connect your saline to the giving set as you would do normally and squeeze that fluid into the bladder as quickly as you can. So once we've got it into the bladder, we don't want it coming back out of the bladder. So we need to, to clamp the catheter. So in your delivery pack, in your home birth kits, you will have your two Spencer Wells artery forceps. So you can just use one of those to clamp the catheter. Don't use a cord clamp because you need to be able to get it off when she gets into theatre to drain that bladder. So when the ambulance arrives, it may be quicker to actually remove your digital pressure and um, get her to walk to the ambulance. In the ambulance, you will not be able to have her in a knee chest position. You will not be able to undertake digital pressure. So you need to have her in left lateral or exaggerated sims. So exaggerated sims is where you've got a couple of pillows under the hip to raise the hip up. So essentially, you're trying to do the same as the knee chest. You're trying to get gravity on your side to try and relieve some pressure. When you're in the ambulance, ask the ambulance crew to inform Labour Ward of their expected time of arrival so they can be sure they're ready to receive you. And you need to prepare the woman psychologically for the fact that she is going to be going to theatre, probably going to be um, put under a general anaesthetic and have a caesarean section. Um, if you can't cannulate, you can ask your paramedic to get some cannulas in. If they can take blood, that's great. But you may they may not have the bottles, the correct bottles for the hospital that you're going to. But so at least getting venous access will um, speed up the process once you get into theatre. And so really the leader of Hartman's is just to keep the vein open so that she has got a patent um, venous access when you get to theatre. On arrival in the hospital, she'll go straight to theatre. You need to reapply your digital pressure in theatre because she'll be coming off her side um, so that the registrar can scan. So they will, sc registrar or consultant, they will scan. And if there is a fetal heart present, then they will go straight to a general anaesthetic and a cesarean section. You need to keep the digital pressure on until the baby is delivered. So essentially you are under all of the sterile drapes until that baby is out. And uh, I've been there and it is quite scary. And you could, I could feel the surgeon's knife on, on the um, uh, uterus. So it was really quite scary, um, but you need to keep that pressure on in order that you are giving that baby the best chance. If you have filled the bladder, if you've managed to fill the bladder, then you need to make sure that somebody has, before the section starts, that somebody has attached a urine bag and taken the clamp off so the bladder is emptied before the cesarean section starts. Otherwise, they will um, potentially um, undergo uh, bladder damage at the cesarean section. Make sure that you've asked somebody to get senior paediatric um, support there for resuscitation because this baby is very likely to be born in extremely poor condition if it's born alive at all um, and so it will need extensive resuscitation and uh, allocate someone to get some cord gases from the placenta for you. That will give you an indication of how compromised this baby has been. If on scanning the, they discover that there is no fetal heart, then they are likely to step down and go for a vaginal delivery. 
in a hospital situation, if um, you've diagnosed your um, called prolapse, you'll pull your emergency bell, you will apply your di digital pressure uh, straight away. Um, and as with the home, if she's fully, she's a multi, good descent, um, then prepare for delivery and resuscitation. If you you may well find that um, your registrar may be able to do a, a von twos if it's very low. Um, if she's got to go to theatre, if you're going to theatre, then you keep your digital pressure on and you transfer into theatre with you on the bed with the woman and then it will go straight to um, general anaesthetic and caesarean section. So thinking about some consequences for the mother, you've got all the complications of caesarean section. So this is major abdominal surgery. So you've got pain, you've got lack of mobility, um, you've got increased hospital stay, you've got an increased risk of VTE, so venous thrombus embolism. Um, you have got to think about her pain management, you know, has she got sufficient analgesia? Because if she hasn't, she's not going to mobilise. And as I've said, that's going to increase her risks of VTE. Think about her um, applying TED stockings, make sure that you have measured them correctly so she has got the correct size on for her. Making sure she's hydrated adequately. Um, bereavement is a real possibility here. These babies, um, if they survive, are likely to be profoundly affected by the um, hypoxia. So she is likely to be bereaved, either bereaved because her baby has died or bereaved of the child she was hoping for that she hasn't really got now because it is quite severely damaged. You've had your um, hands in doing soft tissue. Um, trauma is likely to be a problem, bruising and the risk of infection. So these women are very often given prophylactic antibiotics um, at section. And caesarean section itself, plus all the fact that we've been um, had her hands in, increases her risks of postpartum hemorrhage as well. So closely observe her low cure and make sure that she is um, not bleeding excessively. And of course, if she does have a PPH, that is going to predispose her to DIC or disseminated intravascular coagulation. This is a very traumatic event, as all the emergencies are for these women and their partners. So you need to be thinking about debriefing them and going through the birth with them, what happened, why things happened, and then often give, give them an opportunity to come back at a later date and debrief again, because they won't always take on board what you've said at the time. If the baby has survived, it is almost certainly going to be in special care. So therefore you will have separation so and bonding issues. So you need to think about how can I support the mother with that. So ideally get her around to see her baby as soon as possible. Get photographs of her baby from NICU if it's not possible to get her around there. Some units have uh, video links to the babies, particularly with COVID. Um, if she's... Uh, even if she's not going to breastfeed, get her to wear breast pads, things that will um, have her smell on it. And then they can go to NICU and be in the incubator with the baby. So the baby has the mother's smell there. If she is going to breastfeed, think about supporting her. How can you support her with her feeding? So um, helping her hand express, pump, um, looking at pictures of the baby while she does that, creating the right environment so that she will uh, lactate well. Uh, potentially with caesarean section, of course, you can think about anemia as well. She'll probably need a post um, caesarean full blood count just to check that she's not anemic. And consequences for the baby. Well, we have said that death is a real potential consequence for these babies. And if not death, certainly hypoxic brain injury. This is a hypoxic event. So um, the longer the delay um, the more compression there is there, the more likelihood this baby is going to either be um, damaged or die. The complications of resuscitation, so thinking about hypoxia, hypoglycemia, hypothermia, hydration, all of those things that need to be considered for this baby, uh, and obviously a delay in going home because it will be in NICU or special care, whatever's at your trust. And any in, uh, admission to NICU, leads to an increased risk of infection because most of the procedures going on on these babies are quite invasive. And like with mum, you need to think about um, the separation and bonding and feeding. So how are you going to support that 
um, mother and baby to um, achieve those. And there we have it, called prolapse. I hope you found it useful. Uh, please do leave any comments in the comment section below. And if you haven't already subscribed to the channel, please do. I look forward to seeing you next time.